Hey, good evening, Des Moines. Welcome to the Doc and Lefty program here on webcast1live.com. Coming to you from the soggy, wet downtown studios of Webcast One Live. Uh, we're here. It's election night. We've got uh, uh, the primaries are going on, and with me across the uh, political divide, br- helping bring me or helping me bring you the perspectives you hate from the sides that you love, or whatever some such nonsense. He won't watch NASCAR because of all the left turns. Dr. Patrick Petroche. Doc, what's up? Hey, what's going on? How was your weekend? Hey, you know, I can't complain. I had a gig on Monday, cleared some of the cobwebs out, and got right back to uh, uh, or, performing legal malpractice on anybody I can get my hands all on. All right, great, great. Now, we're going to skip all the usual stuff. We have special guest, uh, Senator Brand Zahn, who, honest to goodness, when I asked him to come on yesterday, I thought he'd say no, but... He loves us so much. Here he is, Senator Brad Zahn. Brad, how are you doing? I'm doing great, and I'm always good to be on both. I'd be with both of you and be on your show. Oh, you and Lefty, yeah. especially, oh especially, especially Lefty. Me. Oh, I like man. Lefty. Well, I think he being with you just gives him more of an appreciation for being with me. Well, you there can't you love go. the good so without how, understanding the bad. Tell us exactly how tough this campaign has been compared to 2010. Well, the primary. Uh, obviously, I think that the not trying to be disrespectful to some of the people that I ran against in 2010, but there's there was good people I ran against then. There was seven of them. Uh, the quality and the caliber of this group is definitely high caliber, um, and I really, uh, I really, they're all really awesome people. I really like them all. What do you have? Uh, I know I was talking to you as, as we were walking up here. Do you have any gut feelings? Do you have any sort of political intuition? Well, I mean. You know, I hate to, you know, okay, gut feeling. I called probably 200 people today. I called like 400 yesterday. Um, I feel optimistic about my chances, Um, not overconfident. Uh, I'm really pushing hard to avoid a convention. I will tell you that based on some of the internal things that we've seen, uh, it'll be close. But right now, based on some of the indications I have, we do – we should possibly be. Uh, I just don't want to go to convention. Right. Um, I think that I'd be all for having a runoff and, and talking and having that conversation at another time. But, you know, I'm not into polling. Obviously, today is the most important poll. Uh, polls could show you something and do the opposite. Uh, but I feel good about some of the people I talked to. A lot of people, and I don't know if they were just being nice to me because I called them to say, I'm voting for you. Uh, but heck, we'll see what happens. And, Whatever God uh, puts out uh, in his plan is what I'll accept. Do you have to get 40% to avoid a runoff? Or what's 35%. The, 35%. Mm-hmm. Well, now I can I can tell you, now I, I don't know who, who you read, and I know when I was on the campaign trail, my reading fell off a little bit, simply because there's not enough time. Now, the people I've read think that if there is going to be a convention, it will happen because of the 3rd District, if, because that's one that's least likely to make it to 35%. However... Um, I don't, I don't necessarily believe that. I mean, you have a significant polling lead, according to the Laura's poll. Which well, came out. well, that was kind of an outlier, right? Uh, well, it was, it was a, it's a good indication. It's pretty reflective of what we had. There was 50% undecided. I think what right. happened is you had you got a lot of good candidates. There's six of them compared to some of the other districts that are uh, having competitive races. Uh, you know, I, we'll see what happens. I mean, I, I tell you, the best thing and the most thankful thing I am this tonight is that I did not have to run against this. It was a very strong candidate, and that man was Pat Betroch. <laughs> <laughs> you know, now he's just blowing You, you don't have to suck up to us. We're just, we're just two-bit web jockeys Whatever. here on That's right. That's what we do. Com. Whatever. Uh, let Whatever. Me, let me ask I you. mean it. You're a good friend. Well, well, you know, I actually thought about running against you just so you'd have some entertainment out there on the, <laughs> on the campaign trail. Well, <laughs> we have a lot of entertainment this go-around as well. All right, but, good. Uh, anyway. Let me ask you this, uh, Senator. If... You've got it. You're running. If you were to be fortunate enough to get the uh, the vote in a you know, right away, and you hit the ground on June fourth with your uh, general election campaign, you're going to be running against Stacey Apple. Mm-hmm. Lo- a lot of name recognition, at least in the Des Moines area and her her home uh, home county where she's from. Yeah. Um, and I was talking. To, I've been talking to Doc about this last couple of weeks. Are you concerned at all? that the Democrats are just going to flip that page back to the 2010 Brad's on playbook mm-hmm. and, and just kind of go after you. And if, if, will that be 
effective here in 2014. Well, I'm not, I'm not that concerned about it. Uh, I've been very out front about some of the negative ads that were run last time. Uh, and, and with my Des Moines Red Strait 12 board, I kind of set the record straight. Here's what I'd tell you is this. Uh, last time, I thought I'd be rewarded because I didn't run any negative ads. I didn't respond to anything. I learned a hard lesson. This time, I will be responding to these untruthful things that are being said about me. And we I've tried to get out front of some of these these negative ads that were overinflated. Uh, but, you know, I, it's going to be tough. There's no doubt about that. The difference between this time and last time is, number one, there's no incumbent. Right. Uh, they have an incumbency protection plan in Washington, D.C. doesn't matter if you're Democrat or Republican. The second thing that's going to be better is uh, that this is a Republican-leaning district. There's more Republicans in this district than the previous district that I ran in in 2010, which is more Democratic. Uh, I've learned a lot. I'm a more relaxed. It's very intimidating to run for something mm -hmm. like this. I've actually have been enjoying this, and uh, I will be playing smarter. The issues I've gotten, I, I got some help in regards to the issues. I didn't really feel like I had a real good grasp of the issues. And I know Stacy. I can tell you that she's a she's a very nice person. Uh, I served with her in the Iowa Senate. Mm -hmm. uh, my my son debates a couple of her sons, and uh, you know, from a mother's perspective, I think she's a very wonderful person. But we are going to be talking about issues because there is stark differences between myself and Stacy. Do you think that? Uh We've been hearing a lot, and and I don't want to push you too much from the left here on this. Suspect you know you've got places to be and you've got a party to get to here in a, in a few minutes, but I am curious because we've been hearing a lot from both sides about some gender politics with Joni Ernst running for the Senate seat with Stacey Apple, and and so the 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 talking heads and and the and the political folks around Des Moines especially. First woman elected for, you know, we're either going to have if, if Joni Ernst wins her primary, we're going to have the first woman uh, possibly being elected to the Senate. Stacey Apple from the third district, the same. And there's a lot of uh, um, uh, uh, women running out in the first and the second out uh -huh. east. Yep. It, do you think that um, that's going to play a role if you're the nominee and, and uh, you're running against her in the general? Do you think that's is that something that is in your calculus to kind of to address or to or does it just all it's about really issues? i've i've ran against a female when i ran for state senate the first year uh really i think iowans are pretty smart if it is a female that would best represent us in washington dc who cares if they're male or female right we want to get behind the right person uh so i i i have not i have i don't think that's going to have any kind of influence whatsoever Okay. All right. Now, there's a couple of things. Uh, people are talking about the low voter turnout this time. It's going to be even lower than it was in 2010. Uh, in fact, an update from Steve Dace uh, states that low turnout everywhere and could make polls fall fall off uh, or look off. Um, do you think a low voter turnout benefits you? You know, I've someone said to me that there is some low turnout there, and they said, Brad, this is going to benefit you. And I haven't quite, an, I don't really understand what's going on. I guess what I'm more concerned about is the, because of the storms that are hitting right now. Mm -hmm. um, I was told, and this might be rumored, that in Pottawatomie County, that they did mm -hmm. shut the polling places down for an hour or something like that. One thing I don't want is I don't want anybody to get hurt just to go out and vote. Uh, so hopefully that won't be an issue uh, tonight. But, you know, whoever votes, votes. And whatever the whatever the results are is what I'll accept. Now, I see you have a, a band on there, two, 2 Timothy 4-7. Yeah. What does that mean for you? Um, Why do you wear this? That? I wear this in memory of Brad Payton, who is a oh, very yes. good friend of mine. Yes, All remember. of the people this uh, that uh, were trying to help him, he had pancreatic cancer. Very good friend of mine, political friend of mine. I've been wearing it since he got sick the last June 1st. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think most of us are just wearing it in his memory as well as all cancer. People that have been stricken with pancreatic cancer is really not good. All right. Now, one of the things that was a big issue when we ran together uh, in 2010 that I don't think has been brought up very much this time around, has in the Senate primary, but mm -hmm. not in the congressional term limits. Do you still believe in oh, term yes, limits? Oh, yes, absolutely. I filed a term limit bill the day that I got elected to state Senate, and I've refiled it every successive session from that point on, mine says 12 years. I let it, you know, the people pick what year, you know, what years yeah. is appropriate. Uh, I really believe that we got a problem and it, I, and I hopeful, and I can probably get a lot of trouble saying this, that, that people send new people to Washington DC in both parties. 
because the problem we have in Washington, D.C. is not the responsibility of the Republicans or the Democrats. It cuts across both party lines. I obviously am going to pick a little bit on the, the left-leaning side uh, when it comes to spending. But listen, we're all responsible for that. This was supposed to be public service. I think I just got interviewed, and I've interviewed a lot with a lot of people. And I said, if I'm there one term, so be it. Because I'm going to do what I think is right. And I'm going to do what is in the best interest of the people I represent, not the lobbyists, not my party, not my leadership. And I'm on a mission because of my son, Drew, who's here, and all the other four kids that I have and the younger people. Uh, what we're doing to this next generation is going to be crippling to them. What would you uh, would you self-limit if you were to, to be elected to Congress? Sure. I mean, I have a 12 years. Uh, I want to start with that. Um, but I really don't plan on being there very long. I'm planning on uh, taking a... Uh, bringing a sofa that folds into a bed and sleeping in my office because I want to get home, be with my family, be with my bosses. And 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 so uh, I'm not going to make a career out of this. I'm still going to be very engaged in my business in, in uh, Clive and because uh, that's really my retirement. And uh, so I, I'll be home to talk to the people that sent me there. All right. Looks like we have a phone call for, for Brad. You got a phone call? All right. So let's get our... Oops. Rats. Get the cans on. I'll, I'll the hand, while on. you get a uh, while well, I set up there. around over yeah, here. Uh, uh, Ryan, why don't you patch the caller in there? Caller, are you on the air? Hi, this is Sid. Uh, Sid, oh, hey, Sid, hey, Sid. Hey, Sid, how are you? Good. We're, we're, good. Sitting, we're sitting here with uh, Senator Brad Zahn on the, uh, the evening of the primary election. Do you have a question for him? I just wanted to say I voted. Oh, good. Oh, good, Sid. she said she voted for me. Thank you so much, Sid. I'm very humbled to have you support my support me and my campaign. Always, and um, the party's later, right? Yes, uh, we're gonna be at Christopher's restaurant. It actually starts here in about 45 minutes, uh, which okay. I gotta run home, get into a suit, and then I'll be there. And this is why this is why I love Brad Zahn. He's like, well, hold on, you know, I got this thing to do where I could come spend some time with friends. So he's over here spending <laughs> some time with us. I'm asking for every vote in the last minute. Yes, there you go. So <laughs> thank you very much, my, Sid. Sure. Well, my question is, um, you know, when you get to Washington, uh, what what will be the changes for the child protection services? Oh, I know who this is. Sid. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've had this conversations before. I'll tell you what needs to be done. And that's on a state level is where you've been affected is the Department of Human Services has way too much power. I believe our government has too much power in our lives. And in and, and the unfortunate uh, situation that you have, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure what the role the federal government plays with that, but certainly there is uh, some things that we could probably do out there in regards to the money that comes through the Department of Human Services here in the state of Iowa. Um, but, I, I mean, I, I, I could tell you that we are unsuccessful. You know there was a group put together, and I met with them many times on some of the injustices that were done to grandparents as well as parents, in, in, in your case as well. And I could not get that legislation through, and, and we really pushed hard to get it through the House, and, and they just weren't interested in taking it up. But I believe the Department of Human Services uh, needs their ears trimmed back. Do you Appreciate have, that. All right. Yeah. Do you have any other questions, Sid? Nope, that was it. Perfect. Hey, hey thanks a lot for coming in, and, and feel free to bring us treats any other time. <laughs> we, I will. Always we good to hear you. from you. All, Thank you. All right, thanks a lot. We're gonna Bye -bye. we're gonna sign off now for the uh, for the break. Um, we're gonna run Brad's commercial two last times because it's the primary. <laughs> It'll, hopefully, it won't be the last time. Oh, All right. We'll see what happens. So we thank want to you thank to Senator, Senator Brad Zahn for coming in. Yeah. Thank you, son Drew, who's a really a good-looking kid, for coming in. So thanks a lot, uh, yeah, Senator, for coming in and, and talking with us. We'll be back right after the break. On the whole, I think Washington, D.C. is a terrible place. It's hot, it's humid, kind of smells, and it's totally lacking individuals who know how to create jobs and live within their means. Hi, I'm Brad Zahn, and I approve this message. And I'm running for Congress because we owe it to future Iowans to fix the mess that was created in Washington, D.C. I've had real experience creating jobs, cutting taxes, and balancing budgets while mayor and in the state senate. If you trust me to represent you, I promise I'll go to Washington, D.C. and do the right thing and come home every Sunday to spend time with my wife, my kids, and my neighbors here in Iowa. We cannot leave this country in worse shape than we found it. 
I will not pass this debt on to my children or yours. I will go to Washington, D.C. and tell them enough is enough. Standing together is the only way we're going to get Washington, D.C. to listen. And I hope you'll join me in this fight. Brad Zahn for United States Congress. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we sure do appreciate Senator Brad Zahn taking some time. He's got a book home, because I think he's still got his house there in Urbandale, right? Yeah. He's got a book home, and then get to Christopher's, and that is not an, and get and get changed. That is not an easy thing to pull off here in 45 minutes. But well, uh, what time we really appreciate him showing oh, up. Absolutely. I was, you know, honest to goodness, this is the kind of guy you want to elect, because he's willing to come out and talk to little people. You know, honest to goodness. Yeah, and doesn't get much little than us. No, neither one so of us. So we talked, especially a, since I've been losing weight. We we uh we've talked about, or you you brought up the low voter turnout. Um, and there, I mean, there are Democratic primaries around the state, uh, just not in this particular district. I do not believe, although you know, you can always go out and vote for a Democrat, um, or write somebody else in that you think is more appropriate in either of the two primaries. Uh, but what do you think is driving some of that low turnout on this the primary race, and do you think that that has an implication for the general? Well, I you know I don't know what's driving the low voter turnout. Um, a lot of times, it's the you know obviously off year elections are always lower than presidential year elections. The trick really is is why are people staying home? Well, they're not excited. They're not excited about a lot of the candidates they have out there. What happens a lot of times is you'll get a good crop of candidates that go out and they carry the party tune. Um, you know, like Joni Ernst. Joni Ernst is a great gal, but she's not saying anything different than any other Republican is saying. Um, Brad Zahn, he's out there. He's more of a maverick. More people are are excited to vote for Brad than some of the other candidates. Um, you know, like one of the people that came on our show is Joe Grandinette. Joe's a great guy. I like him. I've known him personally. He's helped me a lot. I think he'd be a great congressman. The problem is, is his supporters haven't raised a lot of money for him, and his support stands at 2%. So we have a lot of people that ordinarily would be out voting for Joe going, well, you know, he's not going to win, so I'm going to stay home. It's the same thing in the Senate race. There's not a lot of, of excitement in the Senate race. Um the 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 problem is is you know you have Bruce Braley and Stacey Apple those are the two people that are running there's no there's no contention over on the Democratic side there's no primary there so back here in the in the Republican race there's not a lot of you can't generate a lot of excitement people aren't giving money like they'd been giving simply because they have you know like they're they have just you know they have so many choices. So a lot of people will stay home and see who gets the nomination, and then they'll start voting more with their money. And that's very typical. If you, like Stacey Apple, raised $736,000 the last she, time. She's got, and well, she's w way ahead of Senator, in fact, Senator Zahn, who is being projected in some polls. I mean, it just, but it. when I said the Loris poll, and I called that an outlier, and, and he's not going to be able to listen to this now, that wasn't a dig at brad's on at all that was just that was the i only meant that that was the only poll that showed him with a, a statistically significant lead over everybody else all the other polls still had him in the lead but just not by as wide of a margin and had significantly more undecided people in the polling sure. and that's but but you i mean well, that stands to reason in an in a district without any incumbents in it well and and that's absolutely true and especially in the congressional race you had Brad Zahn and Matt Schultz. It's basically a two-horse race. Then Matt Schultz gets exposed by the Des Moines Register, which is what they love to do, and he starts dropping. He's down three percentage points. Brad's, Brad starts, you know, uh, what I think is a, almost an insurmountable lead. Now the issue is, is does it go to convention? If it goes to convention, Brad wins. That's my prediction. Well, when you have a lot of people that have lost faith in one of, in one of your main candidates, they have a tendency to stay home. Um, when you start looking at the Senate race, there's a difference between who would you like to win versus who do you think can beat Bruce Braley? Those are the two questions. Now, almost unanimously among the people that are going to vote, the person that they would like to vote for is Sam Clovis. 
Now, when you ask who do you think can beat Bruce Braley, right, the proper response is any of them. The problem is, is they come down to, well, not any of them can beat him. We think that Joni Ernst has the best chance to beat him. And because, you know, the, let's face it, high information voters are the ones that elect the candidates and low information voters are the ones that elect them. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you when you you're looking at Facebook memes uh, and these aren't these shouldn't be representative, but it is in the mindset of a lot of people. Anything to do with the Iowa Senate race and you're characterizing Sam Glovis's job of the hut or Danny DeVito as the penguin, you know, that really speaks volumes. And when you, you know, let's face it, people want an attractive person as a representative. And one of the stories I told before is Howell Heflin. And he, as interns for, uh, for Senator Armstrong, we were all astounded that this guy got elected because this guy really was, I mean, he was hideous. And we couldn't understand how he got elected until we found out, researched and found out back in the days where we had Google, we had to go pick up books, and he had been appointed. Well, he tried to run again and lost. That's the nature of politics. That's the truth of the matter. You have to look good on TV. And Sam Clovis can work a crowd, and everybody loves that. But when your main mode of trying to get your message out is TV and you don't come across that well, then it creates problems for you. I, I, I will take your word for it. I've never run for anything um, and don't plan on ever running for anything. Um, <laughs> but and that's probably smart. It, well, it, I think so. Um, but I, I'm curious as to what you think. I asked a senator a question about, you know, should he be going up against uh, Stacey Apple and what, if any... Um, the gender politics of that particular race would be his answer I thought was appropriate it doesn't matter uh, gender doesn't matter you know running against a man running against a woman it's all the same thing to him he you know it's all about the issues so on and so forth but I wonder what you think so we have we we live in the third district we know a lot of a lot more about the third district than we know about other races around the state um I'm, I'm curious we you and I've had a conversation about how the demo the Democrats. Let me let me kind of I, I lost I well, lost my train of thought. Well, let's talk. Let's, well, I have another update. Oh, uh, about uh, the estimated voter turnout at this point. Now, Potawatomi apparently did close. That's that's what I'm. That's the information mm-hmm. I have. Did close for a while. Things are safe. They went back, but uh, they're estimating that total turnout will be one hundred and fifty thousand. And that's uh, compared to uh, 2010. That was 230 thousand people turned out. That's a lot. That's that's a hit. And, yeah, that's a big hit. And in the Senate race, uh, the exit polling shows Joni Ernst at 30 percent, and then Sam Clovis, Mark Jacobs, and Matt Whitaker all between 18 and 25. So she's walking away with it. Yeah, pretty much. Do and you th- the trick is they think that Matt Whitaker might actually have a giant surge. So, yeah, because of the liber- Liberty people. Uh, the Paul is the Paulistians are. Yeah, that just doesn't make any sense to me. He hasn't done anything that has had any kind. Of, he hasn't done any sort of um, yeah, moving or movement at all this entire time. No, it would be just, apparently it's just been in the last two or three days because the Liberty folks have gotten out there, and he's not even a Liberty guy. No, no, so, he really isn't. Uh, but but gender politics. I'm, I'm thinking. Well, I'm thinking about. Gen- I'm thinking about gender politics, um, particularly Stacey Apple on the Democratic side and Joni Ernst on the Republican side. It is reductive and overly simplistic to say that women will vote for a woman just because a woman is running. And I think that. Well, and, and, and you agree with that? Well, it is very simplistic and also not very true according to other, according to other races. Uh, Geraldine Ferraro. Well, uh, you know, most most women didn't vote for. Her. Well, what? But I mean, she was running as a vice president, and peop, I mean, well, true. And, and the vice president, you just, I think, and wasn't she? Uh, she was. Uh, um, who, who was the who was at the top of the ticket? That was uh, Dukakis. Was it really? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, well, that's not a good example. Well, but maybe you it's for not. The, you, but, but you know, you look at a, you look at other women that have you, run and vote, lost, and vote women don't the, vote. Well, you vote. But what I, the point that I'm making is, would you see more women vote for Stacey Apple by virtue of her being a Democrat than you'd see women vote for Joni Ernst 
for virtue of her being a Republican. And yeah. is there is there any kind of gender political commentary we can derive from that question? Well, yeah. I well, they study this, and I I agree with that. I think that they'll women will vote more for for Stacey Apple because she's a Democrat rather than Joni Ernst because she's a Republican and, and female, you know. Right. Um, the trick is, is they've done a lot of studies, and in fact, the psychiatrists look at this because it's a very strange phenomenon. Nobody understands why women will vote for a Democratic woman but not a conservative woman. And they've looked at, you know, religious bias, gender bias, uh, stances on issues, and it turns out that we haven't figured out why that happens yet. There's a lot of theories out there, but nothing... I mean, they even looked at, you know, our, do one of the studies, and God bless, don't take offense, because I'm just trying to repeat some information out there. Um, they even actually looked at lesbian couples that voted conservatively and how they voted, and it turns out that they voted, lesbian couples actually voted more for the Democratic person, even though they didn't support gay marriage. So that was that was from 2007. Yeah, it, well, and it's just one of these things we haven't figured out why that why this phenomenon exists. It, well, and it's it, and I'm I'm glad that you you um you mentioned that because it's what's so interesting about this is that the easy answer, the easy answer, and the answer that has been peddled by both people on the left and the right for 40 years is because of um, women's reproductive rights and the de- and uh, the Democrat the Democratic stance on it versus the Republican stance on it since Roe versus Wade. That uh, once again a reductivist, over overly simplified um, uh, message because nobody is a single issue voter. As a block, you know, you might you yourself, Dr. Petroche, maybe there's one issue that you vote on and that's it, regardless of party. There are people that are like that. But white men as a monolith are not a single issue voting block. Women as a monolith are not a single issue voting block. But the trend is something in the Democratic message resounds with women uh, uh, more so than the Republican message. And I think that I think that is going to affect both of these two races all right well with that we're going to take another break uh thanks everybody for tuning in we're here every tuesday from 6 30 7 30 p.m um, we'll be back right after the break with more information on uh, our analysis of the primaries and uh, any kind of re- election results that may be coming in thanks everybody for tuning in we'll be back in a minute Petrosian associates how can i help you Petrosian associates will provide you with a friendly caring and confidential place to find help for mental health concerns. We are ready for your call. Our doctor, Dr. J. Patrick Bertroche, provides a full range of psychiatric services for children, adolescents, and adults in a forthright and informative manner while maintaining a casual, comfortable, and relaxed atmosphere. Hey, what's wrong? Logan wants Let's Rock Elmo for his birthday, but since Steve lost his job, I don't think we can afford it. What did you do for money last year when you and John were struggling to make ends meet? My secret? I went to me and mommy to be. We sold all of Megan and Ryan's clothes and toys there. They give back the highest percentage on their items in the area. And it was so easy. Megan's clothes? She's 15. Yes, they can sign newborn through trendy teens. We're not struggling now, but I'm gonna keep saving and making money at me and mommy to be. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for uh, sticking around for the first half hour. We sure do wish all the candidates out there the best of luck with the races. It's primary day. Yesterday was primary eve. I hope that you uh, sent your family a primary eve birthday card or whatever kind of card that Hallmark makes for this sort of thing. Um, But we are are thinking about the candidates today during uh, and and also stay safe while you're voting we got storms all across the state Pottawatomie County already closed down one of their a lot of their polling stations if not all of them because of the storm there's a flash flood watch here in central Iowa until Wednesday and and uh, it was raining as I came to the studio to start the show so just everybody stay safe but get out there and vote it is important even if you do not have a bunch of different options if you're in a district that doesn't have as many options um, on your particular uh, side of the political fence to vote on the way that we have here in the third district um get out and vote anyway and uh um i guess that's what i have to say about yeah. that what else did you want to talk well, about you know the well you know one of the things is i have a pool of about oh 80 or so people that you know are conservatives like me 
and I have another pool of about 100 or so liberal friends that I, that I poll, you know, informally. So this is not a, a steady one. One of the interesting things um, uh, that has been going on is Joni Ernst started out strong. And then she got Kim Pearson's, or excuse me, Kim Reynolds' uh, endorsement. And um, people started talking about her being the establishment candidate, and she's struggled ever since then. Now, don't get me wrong, she's gotten a ton of endorsements, a ton of endorsements. Um, There's a couple that she didn't get. She didn't get Mike Huckabee's endorsement, and she didn't get uh, Bob Vanderplatt's endorsement. And you and I both know having Bob Vanderplatt's endorsement is a powerful thing here in Iowa. Um, what did hurt her is, strangely enough, Mitt Romney's endorsement. Um, out of the 80 people I talked to, 40 said that they, uh, about a month ago, said that most likely they would vote for Joni Ernst unless something you know spectacular happened. And the other 40, about 35, 40, decided you know, they were kind of either undecided or going to split their vote between Matt Whitaker or Sam Clovis. So yesterday, I'm making my rounds, you know, talking to my folks and and talking to them and say, and I just said, well, you guys have figured out who you're going to vote for. Almost all of them had decided. 78 had, out of the 80 had decided. And here's what it was. 70 of them were going to vote for Sam Clovis. And I said, well, why is that? Well, he got Huckabee's endorsement. Well, you know, this is a group of people that endorsements don't really matter. So I said, that's pretty strange since a month ago you weren't decided. Well, Mitt Romney endorsed Joni Ernst, and that all made us stop and go, hmm, we're not quite sure we want somebody endorsed by Mitt Romney. So just in this very informal poll, I really can't believe that, you know, and these people aren't representative of every voter. They're representative of fiscal conservative fiscal conservative voters. Uh, So some are socially conservative, some are socially liberal, some are socially moderate, but they're all fiscal conservatives. And that really, I think, is what's slowing Joni Ernst down. And I was really kind of surprised. Now, I think Joni is going to be able to do this last minute push. Those two uh, um, commercials that she had were really effective. She got a pretty decent bounce out of it afterwards. Uh, People, you know, when you talk about Joni Ernst with low information voters, they always say, oh, she's a hog gal. Well, uh, you know, just like in politics. She made that ad, though. She did make that ad, but even bad, bad, bad news is still news. Well, here's you know? the, this is, and this is, I, I had asked you this question, and I wonder if you're starting to come around to me, to my way of thinking about it. I'm not saying that this, that I'm not saying that this is how, this is the reality. But when you do an ad like the hog ad, when you do an ad like the uh, riding your motorcycle to the gun range, these on the nose sorts of things, and then you follow that up with the classic, I'm a mother, here are my kids, here's my family ad, which she just did. I think that you run the risk, and I would say this about any candidate that did this kind of thing. There, because there are plenty of bad kids, doesn't it, it, plenty of candidates that release questionable advertising i think that it make it makes you run the risk of looking like a sideshow i think that some of the things matt whitaker has said on his website that he is that the messages that he leaves there about certain issues i think makes it run you makes it run the risk that you pigeonhole yourself as the i'm the hog person i'm the religious liberty person who only wants to talk about game i'm the game marriage person you you it narrows the focus so that a chunk of voters who's could get fired up about gun control or gun rights or gay marriage or or uh on the uh, opposing or or supporting it makes it easier for them to vote against you depending on where they fall on that one issue that's and i think that has happened to Joni Ernst since she released that first ad yeah well you know i'm gonna i'm gonna say you know i understand you don't want to risk making caricature of yourself here's the thing though she did get a bump from that from that ad people on the left and right both agree that spending in washington is out of control people on the left and right both agree that, you know, this this culture of self-service in Washington, D.C. needs to end. And I think everybody could get behind that message. Um, the problem Isn't is... It, it, don't you always say it's not the message, it's how you deliver it? 
<laughs> yes. And the thing is, she li- delivered it in a way that was memorable. And sometimes that works great. And in my case, it doesn't. All right. Mm-hmm. So I understand that. It's a two-edged sword. I think she went a little too far with the with the NRA gun rights uh, commercial. I think she could have done that in a less in-your-face so it doesn't scare gun haters away and gun grabbers. Uh, and that's the truth. Now, we have a couple of text messages here. So forgive me why I put my glasses back on. Um, oh, my God. Are you ready? Here, are you ready for this one? Sure. Weirdo, meaning you, uh-huh. is correct on the Joni ads. She will be portrayed as a white right wing nut. And the other thing is, you know, I have a, my brother Joe. I, brother this, Joe, I have a name. It's well, Lefty. This, well, this next one's from my brother Joe. <laughs> the, you know, oh, the first one wasn't. Yeah. So this one is uh, Vinder Platz is a kiss of death in Eastern Iowa. And yes, I, and I agree a hundred. Absolutely true. That's absolutely so. true. Eastern Iowa, you've got you've got folks running around uh, the the big. Uh, uh, the 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 old industry uh, places. You've got the blue collar, still traditional Democrats in Cedar Rapids. You've got the crazy commie liberals in Iowa City. It just it is it is a bad place to be if you got if you got BVP coming on on your uh, your doorstep. Oh, uh, absolutely. Now that helped Santorum quite a bit in the presidential race, but you know look at how he tanked after that. I mean, any state that was more liberal. Than Iowa really, really tore into Santorum because well, of his because as Bob Vanderplatz isn't just about social conservatism. He's about the very same thing he campaigns against, and that's judicial activism. You know, how much more judicially active can you be than to get out there and say, if you don't vote the way we want you to, we're going to actively seek your removal. Uh, and to me, don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, at first I, I was all for all well, with. Uh, Bob Vanderplatz on his on his crusade to get rid of the judges. Well, but remember that show we did. My brother came in, and your my br- brother and you, doesn't agree with me on anything. We agreed on that. That's right. And my brother Joe does not agree with anything Lefty says. My brother Joe is one of the most conservative Christians that you're going to meet. And when he sits there and says, "Yeah, Bob Vanderplatz has this all wrong," and they got rid of great jurists. Yep. That's when you have to stop and go. Hmm. Now, uh, we're going to take a quick break, but the one thing I do want to say is my brother Joe has had a major surgery this morning, and he loves me enough to watch my show. So thanks a lot, Joe. I hope you're doing well. I'll be over on Thursday. We'll be back right after the break. From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Somebody help! Help! Save us! Hi, I'm Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. Hooray! We're saved! Consumer Credit! You're our hero! If Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of America was your personal webmaster, Tom would filter out all bad debt emails. If Tom was your mailman, you'd never get any debt reduction junk mail. If Tom Coates was a lineman, he'd block any phone calls offering to reduce your credit card debt. Hi, I'm Tom Coates with Consumer Credit of America, and we're still your best choice for credit counseling. We're local, we're accountable, and we can do more. You make the call when the time's right for you. When it comes to competition, there really is none for Consumer Credit of America. Hey, welcome back, everybody. Uh, thanks for sticking around. We've got a we got a few a few minutes left to talk about some of the issues. I don't know if you've got any uh, further thoughts on on some of the elections tonight. I think, you know, I uh, I well, just remembered that I didn't get out and vote yet today, so I've got a oh, yeah, I got, got a high tail. Well, what's nice is that my polling station is right on the way home. I got to stop. I got to grab some dinner. For, for myself and my lovely girlfriend, stop at the post office on 2nd, and then it's just a couple of blocks up there right right on the way. So well, what, I'm in good shape. Well, one of the things I want to I point out that is reflecting in the primary is the absolute chaos that is going on in the Republican Party. We've talked about this and talked yep. about this, and it's really not getting any better. There were five open slots for Republicans where nobody was running – on my, on my uh, voting sheet, and the the trick is is 
you know, when you have a Democrat in District 40 in Urbandale, you've lived there. Yes. He was a lone lefty in the entirety of Urbandale, I promise. And if you can't get a Republican to run against a Democrat, when you have at least a plus six advantage in Republican to Democratic voters, what does that say about the Republican Party? Honest to goodness, I got bombarded with a couple of people wanting to write in. You know, the doing a write in in the primary four yeah. days, five days before the election isn't going to get you elected. I mean, I was going to write this kid's name in. I couldn't remember his name. Now, don't get me wrong. People, people see me and Lefty square off. I treated this kid just like that because he said something that to me really kind of made me mad. And the guy, the kid stood there and took it. So I think he's going to make a great representative, but he didn't make enough of an impact on me to remember. He's not, <laughs> you know, nobody's helping him in the Republican Party trying to win this seat. And they keep telling me, oh, it's a priority seat. It's not a priority seat. If it is a priority seat, you guys are doing such a terrible job. Everybody ought to step down, especially in the Polk County administration. Now, we've had Will Rogers on here, and I yes. think he's a great guy. But I believe a lot of this boils down from the, the state. Uh, the, the state Republican Party, um, you know, when you have uh, a treasurer, nobody's running for treasurer in my district They're on the Republican ticket. Um, there's there's well, all kinds of spots that are open and the Republicans can't find anybody to run. Well, here's but this is and this is what's so confusing to me about how Iowa Republican politics are going. We've and gosh, I don't know. Is I don't I don't know. Is this horse dead yet? I mean, we keep beating this horse and I'm not so sure that it's dead, but, but Kind of follow me on this because I think that I've got a uh, a line of logic that you're going to be interested in hearing. We have a dem- we have a Republican governor in this state. We have a re- not only do we have a Republican governor, but we have a Republican governor who's been around for so long. He's basically a brand name in Iowa. Everybody knows yeah. Terry Branstead. Everybody knows they're getting with Terry Branstead. Everybody understands what Terry Branstead is all about in Iowa. And yet, and when you have that, I guess the point I'm trying to make, when you have that, you typically have an idea of what the party identity is going to be. It's a Branstead party. And yet, in Iowa, it is not. And I think that's because the Republican Party in Iowa as a whole has no idea what kind of party they want to be. Do they want to be a Branstead party who has who has sincere um, uh, articulate positions on things that other kinds of Republicans don't care about, like bullying or, or, uh, or um, renewable energy or health care that actually, even though I disagree on a lot of what he did with the health care initiative, he still did expand Medicaid. He was willing to make that compromise. He was willing to work with uh, Democrats and the federal government to expand Medicaid coverage for folks. And it has helped a lot of my clients. I can speak from experience on that. Or do you want to be the party that if they don't get the whole nut, they don't want any of it. Well, and that's and I think that the Republican Party has a crisis in that lack of identity, and they have a Republican governor. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, I don't think you can beat this particular horse to death. I'm going to keep saying it until the Republican <laughs> until the Republicans get their get their stuff together. It's going to make us really well. It's going to make me more. I don't know if I can get more unpopular, but it's going to make you unpopular, and you might as well just. You know, give it up and become a well, you Democrat. Know, I want to repeat a phrase that Ed Fallon told me one day. We were sitting there talking about Democratic politics during one of the commercial breaks, and he was kind of being a politician. All of a sudden he said, F it. I'm not a politician anymore. I'm in radio. And then he told me what he thought. Well, that's where I'm at. You know, I would love to be a politician. Well, that's not even true. Hell, I can't even lie good on the air. I like being on the radio. I'm going to say what I think, and I'm going to say what I feel. That is a lesson I learned running for Congress. And the bottom line is, is you know, you have purists in the in the Republican Party that command a lot of power. Steve Dace foremost among them. And Steve Dace is basically saying, unless you vote everything the way we tell you to vote, we're not going to vote for you. I mean, he has said that over and over on his show. He posted on his Facebook. That... These are the people that are rabid and going to go out and vote. Now, not rabid as in it's bad, but rabid as in they're, dedicated. They're energized. They are energized. Great. Thanks for that bailout. You're welcome. So they're energized for this. They're going to go vote, and this is the way they believe. 
Now, the problem is that re- represents five, maybe 10% of the party. Yeah, it's just. And, and the problem is, is those 10% amazing. are the people that scare the fiscal conservatives that are more moderate in their views. And uh, honest to goodness, that's what happens. And when you start talking about Mitt Romney, well, he alienated his base, and then he turned right around and scared the the the, the moderates. So 11 people stay at home. 11 million people stay at home. The thing with the Republican Party is, and, and I don't like Doug Gross very much, right? And there's a lot of things he's done that I haven't appreciated. But he is right about this. Elections are about numbers. And you have to be able to get as many people into your tent to vote for you as you can. Lefty says it all the time. Democrats hold their nose and go, mm, at least we're going to be elected, right? At some point, Republicans have to do the same thing. Otherwise, what's going to happen is the same thing that happened to the Green Party in Europe. Green Party still has power. They were surging, and then they decided they needed to be pure. And then they started saying, anybody that doesn't vote 100% the way we tell them to vote, we're not going to elect or support. Next thing you know, they're back. No, they're back down to being a you know, marginal party. Um, so that's, that's my issue. I, I can't believe they can't find anybody to run, you know, uh, you know, I just can't believe it. Um, uh, especially with somebody like Brad Zahn right there, somebody like Jake Heifel right next door that can generate, I mean, Jake Heifel beat Eric Ella Helen, Eric Helen's a hell of a guy. He's a great guy and he beat him. Right. That's our party is so split along those three things. We're going to be back right after break. We want to thank everybody for tuning in. We also want to thank uh, Anesthesia uh, or Des Moines Anesthesia PC. Their number is 263 5316. They have offices here in Des Moines as well as in Fort Dodge. Um, they do a great job. Uh, they do all kinds of pain management. They have new procedures. Honest to goodness, they have a procedure where if you are having back pain because of your disc collapsing together, degenerative joint disease is what they call it, uh, and they have a way of being able to inject uh, a, a uh, cement-like thing into these joints so it expands them back out, and it's an instant relief of back pain. It's amazing. These people come in, have their procedure, and walk out two hours later. It's absolutely amazing. So you at least ought to call. If you're having that kind of pain, you at least call them. Uh, we also want to thank Brad Zahn because, of course, you know, I, I hope he wins. I think he can. Uh, we want to thank Halo Capital, uh, Petrosian Associates, and, of course, uh, Lubinus Law Firm. Um, now, is there anything in this last segment that, you know, you want to discuss, you know, from a liberal perspective or, um, you know? Well, I, you know, the, the news on Friday of Eric Shinseki stepping down, you know, tendering his resignation, I think is an interesting it to me it felt inevitable once more and more places were found out to have been cooking their books and 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 uh creating false documents to now, get do down you, the do wait you times. Think this but, came from the top down, or do you boy, just think it's mid level bureaucrats covering their, their butts? Oh, you mean uh, uh, this whole thing. Well, I think we're gonna have an investigation into that. I don't I think that there's gonna be um a committee, but I <sighs> I just, or there's going to be a lot of hearings about what's causing this, but I just get really, frankly, get, Frank, I hate, I hate playing politics with this, but I almost can't help it because you have all of these Republicans in the Senate on their high horse, Lindsey Graham, John McCain, all these guys calling for Eric Shinseki's head, calling for some accountability on this VA problem, throwing uh, um, all sorts of mud at the president and the Democrats about, you know, this happening on their watch, when this has been a problem under other administrations, both Democratic and Republican, for years, and most recently, the Republicans, 41 Republicans filibustered a bill to increase some sort of or make some sort of uh, funding stream available or, or increase access to care at the VA because they had a budget concern over it. These are the same guys who don't seem to have any problem sending folks to war, but they don't seem to want to pay for the fi- uh, pay for the care when they come back from war. And it just and that's really been an an underreported narrative throughout this whole thing that these Republican senators are, are voting the wrong way and people need to really know about it and well, pay attention. It, well, you know, now I'm going to say, I'm going to say now I'm, I'm forced to defend 
people cutting VA benefits. All right. So keep that in mind. I'm not, I mean, it's one of these hold my nose kind of things. Here's what the problem is. The VA is flush with billions of dollars. They didn't spend on care. What, what are they doing with that money? They're not spending it. So why not take that money back if they're not going to spend it? Number one. Number two, I believe that when that information came out that the VA was flush with money for treatment, yet they don't, these veterans are waiting 18 months, to two years to get in. That, I think, is what led to his resignation. Now, the other thing I'm going to tell you, and we've talked about this before, mm -hmm. VA care might be good, might be bad, might be average. Who knows? But I do know that if you have to wait 18 months, 24 months just to get in to see a doc, that is uncalled for. I've, I will tell you, I've gone to the VA here in Des Moines, volunteered my services, volunteered them, and I haven't heard back. I call them once in a while, see what it is. I'm even a member of Vet Pro, which is what you have to be a member of in order to be able to uh, see uh, people at the VA. Never a call back. I don't know. They I just, even tell me, well, we don't have room for one. Well, great, send them over. I just think that the folks, because it wasn't just Republicans that were calling for Shinseki's head. I'm not, and, and, yeah. it, and this scandal is bipartisan. OK, yep. I, I, I don't want to I don't want to not acknowledge the fact that there's been a failure on both political parties. But it used to be it, you, that after Viet after Vietnam, the veterans have been this sort of holy grail political football that both sides trot. You know, we trot our veterans out to, to feel good about ourselves as a political party. The well, Democrats but, but, do but it. Let, the let Republicans me, let me, do let it. Let me stop you there. Up until the mid eighties, veterans were crapped on. That's what I'm talking about. All the time. No, because, oh, I see what because, you're saying. Of, because of the guilt of that. Yeah. Because of the I guilt, the guilt of Vietnam war now. veterans coming home yeah. after, after that, after the mid eighties into the, the nineties and especially with the Iraq and Afghanistan war, Wars we've seen, um, just the the yellow ribbons uh, magnets on cars and and uh, um, and and photo ops yeah. and all kinds of things for both uh, people of all political stripes doing this and still not being able to fix the problem. So congratulations, everybody that wanted this resignation to happen and fought f and uh, and put the heat on the president to basically force him to to resign. I hope that you're willing now to roll up your sleeves and get at the systemic root of this thing rather than just up. Oh, here's our here's our show horse. We put him out to pasture again for the second time. This is the second time Eric has been run out of Washington for once during the Iraq war. Now this um, I guess we don't have to, if, if the response is he's gone, we don't have to work hard to fix well, yeah, it, that's, that's the true. wrong thing. Well, the other thing is, and I believe this is why it became such a firestorm, is this is the very, one of the one of the key issues that President Obama talked about yeah. no, and that's ran true. on that's in true. 2007, 2008, and, and nothing has happened. Now, we have all kinds of other things going on, but, you know, I, I believe the, the problem is, and this is why I asked, do you believe this is a middle management problem where... People take this money in and then are just doing what they can to save their jobs and make sure they don't get fired. Or do you think this is a problem that comes from the top down and not necessarily Obama, although he can do something about it, not necessarily Obama, but the people that run the VA? It would be amazing if it were, because that would mean that George W. Bush had the same had the same mentality that Barack Obama did. That means that uh, Bill Clinton had the same mentality as George W. Bush. That well, mean, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about I mean, I'm not saying top as in Obama. I'm saying top as in Shinseki or whoever's running the VA administration. But those are aren't those those are political appointments made by presidents though. You would you would expect them to have similar viewpoints to those particular president administration. I don't think it's not I don't and I could be wrong about this. I'm just kind of going on a limb. You bet, you bet. I don't think that it's a necessarily a sort of one of those bipartisan appointments like the like the labor appointment you know where the yeah. where a republican can stash a conservative democrat just to say they're bipartisan and vice versa i don't think it's that kind of thing and so although it should be i think that the the head of the va has got to be a nonpartisan guy and i, I certainly Aaron Shinsek, eric shinseki's never been political that i've ever heard him like overtly yeah, yeah. partisan that i've ever heard so it i can is it possible that that uh uh Four presidents going back to Ronald Reagan. Five presidents have picked well, inadequate the, leadership. It just oh, to me that the, to me that it's well, possible, but, but it, it boggles yeah, but, the imagination. All right, so it's a middle management problem. Then is that what you're saying? I got to think it has to be right. All right, so so the how career are you folks this? that the career folks that don't get 
tossed out with every new administration. All right. So let me go out on a limb here, just like just like Lefty did. Now, we're going to institute the same kind of mid-level bureaucrats that can decide who gets treatment and who doesn't and determine the wait list in things like Obamacare. This is an institutional problem. It's a bureaucratic problem. Now, if you read, if you read um, Omar Bradley's biography, he talks about when he started it up, that was one of the main things he was worried about is mid-level and higher bureau- bureaucrats trying to protect their jobs making the wrong decisions. And at that time, he went through all the procedures that he wanted to go through. I can tell you that working in the VA, the number one goal is to make sure you retain your job, right? You make sure you document. They have this, this uh, I forgot what they call it, but the VA uh, electronic health record system. I had to learn that when I was in residency. You spend a half hour sitting there typing in your in your computer and then you start asking the the patient the questions. Now I, I can tell you I since I do I do understand computers, I would talk to my patients and do everything afterwards, but that isn't the procedure you're supposed to do. So what would you what would what would you do in order to fix this problem at the VA? I have no idea. I have no answers. It's just it's 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 a lame thing to say fix the problem but don't offer anything, but I'm not I mean it's it's easy to see what the problem is. We're not ter- we, we're not taking care of our folks who come home from the wars that we ask them to fight. That's a problem. It yes, doesn't take I, a rocket science to rocket scientist to identify that. But I don't. I certainly personally don't have the policy expertise to, you know, to say, hey, you got to get those wait times down. I don't know what. I mean, it's the it's the expanded the wars that we've been fighting for a really long time that have put extra stress on fo- people that you know you go off on one tour you might not be in a situation where ptsd becomes an issue but on the sixth or seventh possibly or right? we're even worse where the first tour you had developed ptsd and now you're back to the fourth or fifth time right and compounding the issue yes um could be in and it's so we've, we've we expanded access to that back in 03 and 04 and that's great but we didn't do anything to bo- to bolster the infrastructure to get folks that are suffering, for, especially from mental health issues, brought on by their combat, the help and that they desperately need. Yeah. It's easy to it's easy to treat, relatively speaking. It's easy to identify and treat um, an ampu- an amputation. Yes, yeah, and but treating mental illness is well. We've talked about this. Yep. There isn't any outcome measures you can measure that say this is the benefit that society has. Yep. You know, unlike, you know, if you get somebody back walking again with a prosthetic, that's easily seen. I want to thank Senator Brad Zahn for coming on the show. Uh, we really appreciate the time out that he took. I know he's just up against it. He looked, he didn't look frazzled, but he did look awful tired. Yes, he did. So, you know, and that's not usual for Brad. Um, or, excuse me, Senator Zahn. Right. And uh, we also, and I think Lefty's going to gonna agree with this, we want to thank everybody who's running for elected office. It's a brutal job. Most people don't want it. Most people don't understand the toll it takes on you physically and emotionally as well as your family. So left and right, Republican and Democrat, we want to say thank you for running. And make sure you get out and vote. Um, we'll be back next week. We're going to have a brief analysis of the of the polling. I think I'm going to blog a little bit about uh, mm-hmm. uh, about the results. So we're going to thank all of our sponsors. Thank all. We want of our to thank sponsors. Ryan, our our great producer who makes this show happen. Thank you to webcast1live.com. Get on Facebook and like our Facebook page, Doc and Lefty on Facebook. We're also on Twitter. Um, I uh, go to docandlefty.com. I've got a new blog post up that I'm sure a lot of you are going to uh, want to look at and then send me vitriolic hate mail for because that's just the nature of the game. So um, uh, st- check us out on all the various social uh, network platforms that we are on and uh, and, and, be en- and be Facebook, engaged. Facebook, Twitter. Yes, everything. Yeah. Be engaged in the political process and then let us know what your thoughts are about it. We will, um, I'm sure, talk about some of those on the air. Doc, do you have anything else? No, just uh, everybody get out and vote. Make sure your voice is heard. The less people that vote, the worse the results are. We always know that. So go out and vote. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We'll be back right, well, we'll be back right after next week. (laughs) Be well. (laughs) All right. Hi, I'm Representative Tom Shaw, and I love these guys, both of them. Love these guys. Get over here. Get over here. Love both of them.